Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Justice Committee's 24th meeting of 2017. Apologies have been received from Liam MacArthur. Um, the committee clerks have been notified that the Cabinet Secretary is going to be five minutes late, so with uh, your agreement, we'll move to agenda item number five. Are we all agreed? Excellent. Yeah, can we also, um, just before we take um, agenda item number five, take agenda item non one, which is um, a decision on taking item six and seven in private, Item six is consideration of our approach to the scrutiny of the offensive behaviour at Football and Threatening Communications Repeal Scotland Bill at stage one. And item seven is consideration of our work programme. Are we all agreed they should be taken in private? Agreed. Thank you for that. Right, moving quickly on to agenda item number five, which is feedback from the Justice Subcommittee on Policing on its meeting of 22nd of June 2017. Following the verbal report, there will be an opportunity for brief comments or questions, and I refer members to paper four, which is a note by the clerk, and I invite Mary Fee to provide that feedback. Thank you, um, convener. The Justice Subcommittee on Policing met on the 22nd of June when it took evidence from Her Majesty's Chief Inspector of Constabulary in Scotland, Derek Penman, on his review of openness and transparency at the Scottish Police Authority. The subcommittee heard that HMICS had made 11 recommendations, including holding board and committee meetings in public and making papers publicly available in advance of meetings without any embargo. Derek Penman highlighted, amongst other things, issues with the Chair, the Chief Executive and all Board members on their understanding of on-board guidance, collective responsibility, supporting processes and relative roles. And following the evidence session, Andrew Flanagan sent a response to the subcommittee and I would like to address a couple of points that, that he raised. Mr Penman told the subcommittee last week that staff associations do not think that the current level of engagement is sufficient and that they are looking for better ways to engage. In his response, Mr Flanagan says that stakeholder engagement was championed and endorsed on the Policing 2026 work. And I would just like to say that as the Policing 2026 work predates Mr Penman's report, it appears that the staff associations do not share Mr Flanagan's view and proper engagement is vital. The Chief Inspector's report concentrates on the roles, awareness and understanding of the Chair, the Chief Executive and of Board Members. And whilst there were some recommendations for improving executive structures, the report does not criticise the hard-working staff within the wider organisation. The key findings are focused on the senior management team who should focus on making the necessary changes to improve the reputation of the SPA and in turn the morale of its staff. And the subcommittee will next meet on the 14th of September and I am happy to take any questions. Do members have any questions or comments for, for Mary? No? Nothing? That being the case, then we shall suspend uh, briefly to allow the Cabinet Secretary to sit in, settle into his position. We move now to agenda item number two, which is consideration of the affirmative instrument on the advice and assistance proceedings for recovery of documents, Scotland regulations, 2017 draft. And I welcome the Cabinet Secretary for Justice and his officials, Denise Swanson, the head of access to the Justice Unit, um, Kevin Philpott, Criminal Justice Division, and Greg Walker, Solicitor Director of Legal Services with the Scottish Government. I refer members to paper one, which is noted by the clerk, and um, ask the Cabinet Secretary if he'd like to make a short opening statement. Thank you, Convener. My apologies for my slight late arrival this morning. Uh, Convener, these regulations relate to the F versus Scottish Minister's judgment that was issued in February 2016. Uh, that case concerned the rights of a complainer to receive legal aid when they were seeking to oppose release of their medical records in connection with a criminal case. 
It was an important judgment that has led to a significant change in approach in cases where an application is made to recover sensitive information in criminal proceedings. The judgment clarifies that any person whose Article 8 Convention rights uh, respect uh, for private and family life may be infringed by an order for recovery of medical records and other sensitive documents must have the application for recovery of those uh, records intimated to them and must be given the opportunity to be heard in opposition to that application. Following the judgment on the 1st of March last year, when I was before the committee during scrutiny uh, of the Abusive Behaviour and Sexual Harm Bill, I advised the committee that the court, having established that there is a right to be heard, interim provisions had been put in place to make legal aid available to allow a client to be represented where they were seeking to oppose release of medical or other sensitive documents. The regulations before you today regularise these interim provisions by amending the relevant statutory legal aid framework to make equivalent provision. Specifically, they make provision for assistance by way of representation to be available to a client where they are seeking to oppose recovery of their medical or other sensitive documents in connection with criminal proceedings. As with the interim provisions, the, this assistance will be available without a means test being applied. The regulations also make incidental amendments to advice and assistance ensure that work is done on a consistent basis as assistance by way of representation namely at a criminal rate. Since the interim provisions have been in place, seven applications have been received for legal aid in connection with the potential use of sensitive records in criminal proceedings. Of these, five applications have received legal aid and the two other applications have been given in principle agreement by the Scottish Legal Aid Board for legal aid, with the checking of actual expenditure, expenditure still to be undertaken. Convener, the commitment uh, to put in place sustainable arrangements to protect the interests of individuals whose sensitive records and documents are requested in criminal court proceedings was set out in our programme for government 2016-17, and these regulations seek to deliver on that commitment. Okay, but I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that statement. And can I say I particularly welcome this statutory instrument, not least because over the last four years, on no fewer than six occasions, in three different pieces of legislation, the Victims and Witnesses Scotland Bill, the Criminal Justice Scotland Bill, the Abuse of Behaviour and Sexual Harm Scotland Bill, um, I've lodged amendments regarding complaining, complainers having the right to oppose the release of their medical records, including psychological and psychiatric records. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware on the last occasion, on the 22nd of March, 2016 at stage three of the Abuse of Behaviour and Sexual Harm Scotland Bill, which followed Lord Ganey's ruling in um, 2016. Um, this was to the effect that dom in domestic abuse cases, denying a complainer legal aid to oppose the use of her medical records was contrary to the Victim Witness Scotland Act. Um, so that was the essence of my amendment. And the Cabinet, Cabinet Secretary will also recall that he again rejected my amendment about um, awareness raising of the ruling at that time stating as I have indicated the Scottish Government is happy to undertake the work to ensure that the awareness of Lord Glen Glenny's judgment is raised so while I very much welcome the fact um, that there have been seven applications and that the spirit of registration has already been um, recognised with five applications being approved and two um, in under consideration I wonder if he can provide some comment Comfort in terms of outlining what's been done so far to raise awareness about Lord Glenning's ruling and judgment? Well, the interim arrangements have been put in place and that was inter intimated to the relevant parties um, that it were, our interim arrangements had been put in place. Um, what, we have, what we are planning to do is for um, uh, my colleague Annabel Ewing to write to the Law Society and other parties to make them aware of the new regulations that have been put in place so that there is awareness. 
uh, that they are put in place. You'll also be aware that in Lord Glenny's um, uh, ruling, um, he didn't make any uh, recommendation that there was a need for any rule changes or any new primary legislation to be put in place. Uh, but there was a process where the court would be required to intimate uh, entitlement uh, to, um, uh, to an individual whose documents may be uh, sought, and that's been put in place. My understanding that's also being uh, monitored by the Lord President's office. Okay, but nothing has happened to date to raise the awareness specifically? Well, we've already written to uh, different stakeholders to make them aware of the mm -hmm. interim arrangements which were put into place last year. Um, uh, what we will do is, and my colleague Annabel Ewing will be doing, is again going out to the interested parties to make them aware that these arrangements are now in place and that new regulations have been put in place to make a permanent arrangement uh, available for access to legal aid in these circumstances. So that's a piece of work which my colleague Annabel Ewing will take forward. Okay, thank you. John Finney. Thank you, Convener. Uh, morning, Cabinet Secretary. It, it really is a bit on that. First, to, to welcome the interim provisions that were put in place. I think that was very positive. As part of the, the, the paper we've got here called the policy note, um, on the consultation there's the following phrase, Rape Crisis Scotland, supported by Scottish Women's Aid, raised concerns with reference to Article 8 rights, the use of the effective participation test and the provision of appeals. And it goes on to say these issues were addressed through separate correspondence and do not affect the content of these regulations. Um, the issues, were they addressed to the satisfaction of Rape Crisis Scotland and Scottish Women's Aid Cabinet Secretary? Um, I'm not aware of a response has been received, uh, but if it would be helpful, what I can do is I can also provide the, the committee with a copy of the letter that was sent out uh, to um, uh, Scottish uh, Women's Aid. Denise, do you want to maybe comment on this, because you wrote to them about the matter? Yes, I wrote to them, and, and um, as uh, Cabinet Secretary suggests, we will send a copy of that letter to the committee. Um, I've subsequently met with Sandy Brindley on another issue, um, and this wasn't raised and we haven't had any response from uh, Rape Crisis Scotland to that letter. So uh, from that point, I'm assuming that there are no further issues that they wish to raise on this. But we continue to engage with Sandy, so um, we, will, we, will, um, we will confirm that with her. OK, thank you very much. Are there any other questions or comments from members? That being the case, then we now move to agenda item three, which is formal consideration of the motion in relation to the affirmative instrument. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has considered and reported on the instrument and has no comment on it. The motion to be moved uh, with the opportunity for formal debate if necessary is S5M06068, that the Justice Committee recommends that the Advice and Assistance Proceedings for Recovery of Documents Scotland Regulations 2017 be approved. Um, do you want to say anything further or merely move the, the motion? Move. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Do any members have any comments? No, nope. that being the case, I put the question that the motion 06068 in the name of Annabel Ewing is approved. Are we all agreed? agreed. We are all agreed. That concludes our consideration of the affirm uh, affirmative instrument. The committee's report will note and confirm the outcome of the debate. Uh, is the committee content to agree to delegate authority to me as convener to approve the draft of the report? Are we content with that? Thank you. Okay, I now suspend briefly um, before, I, before, well, first of all, thank the officials who are here for attending and suspend briefly to allow for a change of um, officials and for the Cabinet Secretary to return.
Agenda item four is our closing evidence session on the Domestic Abuse Scotland Bill, and I welcome back the Cabinet Secretary for Justice and his officials, Philip Lamont, uh, Patrick Down, both members of the Bill team, and Louise Miller from the Directorate of Legal Services with the Scottish Government. I refer members to paper two, which is note by the clerk, and paper three, which is a private paper. Cabinet Secretary, do you wish to make an opening statement? Convener, uh, we're grateful to the committee for its scrutiny of this important bill. Uh, the bill aims to address a fundamental gap between the current criminal law and our modern understanding of the true nature of domestic abuse in relationships between partners and ex-partners. The bill was informed by an extensive process of consultations and engagement with a wide range of key stakeholders. Ahead of the committee's questions, I want to set out the Scottish Government's position on two specific matters that have been raised during scrutiny of the bill. Firstly, we know that the committee has heard from some stakeholders who would like a separate parallel criminal offence of domestic abuse of a child to be created. This would be intended to create or to recognise that a child living in an environment where their caregiver is being abused is themselves a victim of abuse. This is clearly an important issue and I want to explain the Scottish Government's position on this matter. Where abuse is directed at a child, the criminal law already can be used as, for example, abuse can be charged at using the offence of child cruelty or neglect at section 12 of the Child and Young Persons Scotland Act. 1937. We are very aware uh, of concerns that the existing offence may not adequately deal with psychological abuse of a child. That is why the, children, the Minister for Childcare and young, young Early Years uh, announced to Parliament in March that this offence is being reviewed to consider whether it, is requir it requires to be updated to reflect a modern understanding of what amounts to abuse of a child. However, it appears that what has been proposed in respect of this bill is different. Our understanding based on evidence given to the committee is that what seems to be proposed is that an accused person should be capable of being charged with two different offences in respect of a single course of abusive behaviour directed against their partner or ex-partner. One offence would be the offence as contained in the bill where their partner or ex-partner is a victim of a course of conduct of abusive behaviour. Our understanding is that the other separate offence would result from exactly the same uh, conduct, but seek to criminalise the harm that occurs to the child of that partner or ex-partner through the abuse directed at the partner or ex-partner. Convener, we're absolutely clear that growing up in an environment in which domestic abuse is occurring harms children. However, we do not think that the way to address this is to create a mechanism where a person can be charged with two separate offences for the exact same course of behaviour. Instead, that is why we have included a statutory child aggravation in the bill. The aggravation is intended to capture the harm caused to a child by ensuring that the court formally takes account of this when making sentencing decisions. In such cases, and states how this was taken account of in determining sentence. This ensures no separate offence is needed for a child to be regarded as a victim and for the impact on the child to be recognised. The other issue I would like to comment on at the outset are the concerns expressed about the threshold when an offence has been committed. Views have been offered that the inclusion of distress within the definition of psychological harm contained within the offence risks setting the threshold for criminalisation too low. We are, of course, happy to consider views on this. However, we have included distress as part of a definition of psychological harm because we consider that merely referring to fear or alarm would mean that courses of conduct that should be criminal as a matter of policy, are not included within the scope of the offence. Courts will interpret the word distress taking into account its dictionary definition. Convener, distress is not synonymous with mere upset or annoyance, as some might consider it to be the case, or might have suggested in earlier evidence. 
The concise Oxford defi uh, Dictionary definition in distress is defined, de defines distress as meaning extreme anxiety or suffering. You have heard from a number of stakeholders, including the Crown Office and Scottish Women's Aid, that behaviour giving rise to extreme anxiety or suffering should be included within the scope of the offence. Our position is that abusive behaviour that causes extreme anxiety or suffering ought to be covered by the offence, and the threshold is set for the offence with that in mind. It is, of course, important to remember that the offence is only committed if all elements of the threefold test set out in the Bill are met. Convener, I am, of course, always happy to discuss and consider alternative ways of achieving policy goals in both the areas I have mentioned, and this includes any specific suggestions that the Committee makes in its Stage 1 report or st stakeholders have suggested in improving the Bill. And of course, I'm happy to take any questions. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that opening statement, in particular to have on record that the definition of um, distress will be, as in the Oxford Dictionary, extreme anxiety um, uh, or suffering is very much welcome, I think, by all of the committee. Um, he's, you've referred, to Car Car Cabinet Secretary, to the course of behaviour um, and how that would affect uh, maybe children on two uh, it doesn't have to be two separate occasions, but I'm presuming that the course of behaviour um, uh, referred to as a safeguard for overcriminalisation provides for a course of behaviour involving behaviour on at least two occasions. Now, would this be still in the bill for um, any adult accused of this behaviour? And if so, does it adequately capture the concept of a course of behaviour in relation to domestic boost if these two separate occasions were in, for example, very close proximity to each other? Well, I think the thing that's important to recognise here is, is it's not just two instances which were random instances. It has to be a course of behaviour. So it has to be at least two uh, instances which are viewed as being a course of behaviour. So, for example, an incident that took place five years ago and then an incident that took place recently um, it would be for the courts to determine when that was presented to them whether they consider that to be a course of behaviour. Um, so it's important to recognise it's about the issue is not about just two instances, it's about a course of behaviour and there has to be at least two instances that could be considered to be a course of behaviour. That's helpful. Mary, followed by Mary, then Fulton. Uh, thank you, Convener. There's just a few areas that I would like to, to touch on today, um, because I would say that, in general, the evidence that we've received over the over this past while has been broadly in, in support of the legislation, um, though, of course, some people would like to see it go further. But I think it has been identified that there is a gap there that this legislation will, will fill. Um, but there are, as I said, a couple of areas I would like, I would like to cover, uh, first of all. I mean, in some of the evidence that we heard from Scottish Women's Aid, uh, one aspect they mentioned, which isn't included within this, is about the emergency barring orders. And I was just wondering, is that something that you would consider uh, as part of this going forward? Well, um, I'm conscious that uh, Scottish Women's Aid have raised this matter with the committee. It wasn't a matter which was raised in the course of the uh, consultation exercise. And uh, as it stands at the present moment, we have um, exclusion orders which can be utilised. So, for example, a victim of a, a domestic abuse can seek a, an exclusion order uh, for someone to be excluded from their uh, home. Uh, but I'm uh, happy in, uh, to, to engage with Scottish Women's Aid to consider whether well, there's further measures that need to be put in place to try and address any concerns which they have. Uh, so, for example, I know that exclusion orders have to be applied for by the person who has been uh, who's directly experienced the abuse. So, for example, the police couldn't apply for an exclusion order, whether there is a need for us to look at whether that should be extended and who could apply for um, exclusion orders and who they could also apply to. So, for example, I'm conscious that some may have raised the issue about children and whether they should, in certain circumstances, be uh, applicable. Again, uh, that's something which we're happy to, to look at and to give consideration to. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, because I think that it's certainly so, uh, something that is used in other countries. I think there are other, are other examples there that we could be looking at. Um, and another important point that they raised during their evidence as well uh, was in terms of the training and the, the campaigns uh, the public education campaigns that will come as a result of this bill as well. And it was just how you envisage that uh, and plan that going forward. I think the point that Marcia Scott had raised was that, you know, sometimes we, have, we can have the best legislation, but it's, it's putting everything else in place after that to make sure that what we're aiming to do with the legislation is actually achieved. So in terms of the, the public education, I think especially in terms of the coercive and controlling behaviour, it's how you see that, what the programme for that would be uh, when this bill goes through uh, and any training that, are, that needs to be done as a result of that too. Well, let me take these in two separate parts. One is publicity around any new legislation and two, the training requirement. Um, as we've set out in the uh, uh, financial memorandum that goes alongside this, as is the case with any new piece of legislation we bring in, uh, there will be a requirement for a level of training uh, for fiscals, for the police and for others that may be working within this particular uh, field and that will be taken into account as we move forward looking towards the introduction of the uh, legislation uh, it, should it be approved by uh, at Parliament and uh, uh, that's not an unusual thing that happens uh, with any new piece of legislation so for example the Abusive Behaviour and Sexual Harm Act that was uh, introduced uh, last year we've already started introducing provisions in that and there has been training taken forward as a result um, of introducing that new piece of uh, legislation. Uh, specifically around the issue of uh, publicity associated with uh, a piece of legislation, uh, as a government, we uh, will, when there's, new, when there's a new offence being brought in, uh, we will always run a publicity campaign highlighting these matters. Very often uh, that's carried out in partnership uh, with other agencies, uh, third sector organisations in particular. Uh, highlighting, uh, to, uh, highlighting the new offence uh, coming into force, uh, the implications of the new offence, uh, but also uh, highlighting what it's intended to tackle. Um, so uh, my view would be is that uh, the, there will be a publicity campaign. Uh, the nature and shape of that, though, is something which will be de developed following the passage of the bill, uh, but to ensure that people are aware of the, uh, uh, of the new provisions within the legislation, should it be uh, past and implications it could actually have for individuals. So, um, yes, I can give you an assurance there will be a publicity campaign around it. The shape and nature of it is not something that we've given mm -hmm. consideration to at this particular point, though. Again, yeah, because I do think it is vitally important, especially around the coercive and controlling behaviour, which I think uh, for some it may not necessarily be the victim themselves that is able to you know, identify the change in their own behaviour as, as a result of that, but particularly for other people uh, surrounding that person, uh, for them to be able to uh, identify that behaviour as well. And the last point I would like to touch on is about non-harassment orders, and we've heard quite a lot in the, in the evidence around that. Um, and again, uh, many organisations would like to see the wording of the bill be a bit a bit stronger on that in terms of a presumption in favour of imposing non-harassment orders and it was just to get your views on some of the evidence on that evidence that we'd heard. Well we've placed a requirement within the bill that the uh, court is required uh, to give consideration to whether a non-harassment order is required at the time um, of uh, uh, sentencing. Uh, we believe that will ensure that the courts will have to uh, consider the issue and also set out their decision on whether a, uh, an non-harassment order is required or not um, as well. Uh, so it places the obligation on the court um, and uh, the sheriff or judge in particular uh, to set that out in a way that isn't there at the present uh, at moment. But of course, I'm always content to look at whether there's ways in which we can strengthen the legislation, but we do feel that the policy intention um, of uh, making sure that our sentences and our courts are considering th these issues at the time of sentence, that the provision we've put in the bill, it should effectively deliver that. Um, another point that was raised as well was in terms of the non-harassment orders in relation to children as well and whether that should be uh, something that should be looked at and included uh, given the fact that a non-harassment order could be in place for the victim of the domestic abuse but how the that abuse can continue uh, through through the children if they are then award, uh, awarded uh, contact with the children of the relationship as well. Uh, and again, it was just to get your, your views on that evidence. Look, we're happy to consider that, to see whether there is um, a, a way in which the issue that's been highlighted could be adequately addressed when it comes to children. 
Um, so that's an issue we're already giving consideration to. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have Mary followed by Fulton, then Rona. Thank you, convener, and, gu and good morning. Um, one of the areas I did morning. want to um, cover was public education and training, and, and Mary Evans has covered most of it. Um, but can I just ask... Um, as the Cabinet Secretary, I don't know if you'll remember, a few years ago there was a very successful um, television advertisement around um, domestic violence. It was quite hard-hitting. Um, and, and I think that is a really good way to raise awareness of, of something which reaches far more people than you could probably ever do by written um, publicity. Would that be something that, that may be given consideration as you look to how you're going to publicise this? Well, there's a whole variety of mediums in which it can be achieved. I'm also very conscious that um, social media now plays a big part mm -hmm. in a way that may not have been the case five, six, mm -hmm. seven years ago. Um, so we haven't, you know, we haven't decided in what the publicity campaign will be um, around the new legislation. <coughs> Uh, uh, so we will give consideration to that. So, for example, some of the provisions that have come in through the um, uh, uh, Abusive Behaviour and Sexual Harm Act, there was a, a I Just Froze a campaign that we supported mm -hmm. fairly recently that was taken forward by uh, at Rape Crisis Scotland. So, um, and that was largely a social media campaign. We've also had social media campaigns in the past which have targeted young people in particular because we know that we can use social media as a way in which to uh, target particular age groups uh, as well. So there's a, a variety of things that are taken into account and looking at what the publicity campaign will be, whether it will be a, a, a TV advert campaign, a radio advert campaign, or social media, a combination of uh, all of these are issues that will be taken into account at the time when we're looking at a publicity campaign. I'm very conscious that I'm before the committee uh, <coughs> looking to conclude its stage one report and Parliament has still to decide on whether it's going to approve this legislation. So I don't want to preempt the decision of Parliament in uh, deciding whether it's going to approve this piece of legislation before telling you uh, that we've already planned what the publicity campaign will be. Mm. Uh, but I can give you an assurance mm. it is something that we will consider uh, when we're in a position once we have the legislation uh, in place. Okay, that's helpful. Um, the the offence in, in, in this bill is, is focused primarily or, or solely between partners or, or ex-partners. Um, and we have heard evidence that the, it, it should be wider t to um, cover domestic abuse between um, other family members. And I'm thinking specifically of elder abuse. Um, is, is that something that you have sympathy with? And do you understand why people might want that to be included in this bill? And why do you not think this is the right place to do it? Well, the definition around uh, this offence being between partners and ex-partners is based on the long-standing definition we've actually had mm. around domestic abuse within our Equally Safe strategy. Um, and uh, that was uh, supported uh, by the responses which we received to the consultation mm. exercise. Uh, so that's why it's rooted in our Equally Safe work uh, and the definition that we have within that about gender-based uh, violence and domestic violence in uh, particular. And as I say, was supported by the responses which we received in the consultation um, exercise. Uh, there are other legal provisions um, available uh, for issues around uh, elder abuse um, and other forms of uh, abuse that can take place within um, a family uh, setting. But I don't believe this piece of legislation is the appropriate place in which to address any of those issues further. It should be said, though, that where, uh, 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 you know, where there is, a, uh, where there is a, for an elderly uh, uh, person, where there is uh, a, a partner or ex-partner is abusing them, then this offence can be applied in mm. those circumstances if it meets the criteria uh, set out within uh, the offence. Uh, so, uh, you know, there are other pieces of legislation that address some of these issues. Um, I'm not aware of any particular issues around gaps in those legislation, a uh, piece of legislation to deal with these matters um, uh, in the way in which we are seeking to deal with uh, uh, modernising our approach to domestic abuse through this offence. Um, but of course, if there are concerns about gaps in existing legislation in dealing with elder abuse um, or other forms of abuse that can take place within uh, a wider family network, then, of course, I'm happy to consider that, but I don't believe that this bill would be the appropriate place to address any gaps that they consider there may be. Of course, the, the reason it was raised was um, more and more elderly people are cared for at home by um, a child, an adult child, 
and the issue of controlling and coercive, coercive behaviour came into play. Um, older people being manipulated for financial gain, and, and that was the reason that this was, was brought forward. But you're content that that can be dealt with in other places? And well, there are adult protection uh, arrangements for dealing with these types of issues, uh, where someone is um, uh, abusing their position in, uh, 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 in the way in which they are dealing with an individual. Uh, so, for example, if it's to do with their finances, etc., there, there's legislation to deal with that. To, there may be issues around, and I suspect what this may be more about is about maybe issues about individuals identifying it uh, and being aware that there's abuse mm. of that nature taking place, reporting it uh, to allow it then to be investigated. That doesn't necessarily mean that there's a deficiency in the legislation. There's an issue about making sure people are aware of these issues mm. and that they are uh, reporting them appropriately. Uh, so, for example, uh, you know, uh, without digressing too much, convener, for example, around issues around elder abuse and when it comes to financial issues, uh, part of the challenge can be the sharing of information between different agencies. So banks sharing information, information with social work, uh, uh, police sharing information with social work, etc., and trying to coordinate a case. And that's why the adult protection arrangements are in place in order to manage these types of issues. Uh, where it is reported, so um, uh, uh, so there are you know there is legislation in place, and there are processes that social work have uh, to deal with adult abuse matters, uh, elderly abuse uh, uh, through the normal adult protection processes. But I'm not aware of any gaps in the legislation. That's not to say that it couldn't be improved, but I don't believe this bill is the right place to seek to do that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Fulton, followed by Rona, then Ben. Thanks, convener. Thanks uh, to the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, you mentioned the aggravation to children in, in your opening statement, Cabinet Secretary. And um, as, I, as we talked about last week, and I uh, questioned some of the witnesses, currently as it stands, if the police attend at a domestic incident, um, whether they report or they make a charge uh, or whatever, there is an automatic referral to both social work and the children's reporter. And this is a way uh, you know, to ensure the safety of the children um, <clears throat> in that process. Um, and there's also got to be consideration given to whether child protection procedures should be initiated. Would you support similar arrangements being made uh, for this offence uh, if, if the legislation is passed, um, for similar procedures being put in place um, if there's police involvement? Well, I think if there, are, there is police involvement, there are concerns about the child's welfare and uh, 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 what the child may have been exposed to, then uh, I would expect that process to be, to be used, yes. So, um, in the review of the Section 12 legislation, you would support that if the, there would be an automatic referral to the children's reporter um, uh, as a result of police involvement? Well, we need to allow that review work to be carried out to look at it. I, I in principle, wouldn't be opposed to it um, if that's the most appropriate way in which to deal with these issues. So we've created the aggravator within this legislation. Um, uh, uh, in the work that my colleague Mark MacDonald is now going to take forward, uh, uh, if, if part of that highlights the need to create some form of automatic referral in other instances, then uh, I, I would be content to look at that at the time. Uh, but I think at this stage, what we need to do is make sure that the aggravator is being used effectively with this legislation um, should it be passed by Parliament. Uh, uh, but the wider work that Mark McDonald has taken forward could help to inform how we can strengthen the existing arrangements for protecting children who may have experienced uh, domestic abuse. Okay, uh, thanks for that. On a, a slightly different uh, note, convener, um, yesterday I actually met with the, the Monkland's uh, Women Aid team uh, at my office um, just to speak about some of the work they're involved in, in locally. Um, and just like uh, the, the national counterparts are very, very supportive of this legislation, um, we talked to, at length about that. Um, what role do you think that these uh, third party, uh, third sector organisations and, and, and similar uh, to Women's Aid will have in terms of the, you know, the prosecutors building a case of uh, a course of behaviour, um, you know, against against an individual? What, what role do you see these? Uh, organisations having in that process? Well, um, women's aid organisations right across the country do a fantastic job in helping to support um, uh, victims of domestic abuse. Uh, and uh, very often women will uh, disclose information to them uh, before they will disclose it to the police uh, or to what they might see as an authority figure. Uh, 
and they may be in contact with an organisation such as the local women's aid um, service over an extended period of time, uh, but not necessarily report matters to the police as well. So I would imagine that in, uh, it depends on the circumstances with individual cases. Um, it may be about supporting the women to uh, be confident enough to report the matter to the police in the first place, to give them reassurance and support in going through that particular process, helping to give them an understanding of what's involved once a matter has been reported to the police and how it will then be investigated and how it will be taken forward, and to give them reassurance that they will be there with them during the course of uh, that process. Um, it could also be about... Uh, 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 you know, women who who may at that point not be ready to report the matter is to continue to work with them and supporting them and to offer them advice and assistance um, as well. But I think particularly with this uh, legislation, it will hopefully send out a signal that uh, all forms of domestic abuse uh, won't be tolerated. Uh, we know there is a particular challenge around uh, being able to uh, prosecute uh, coercive and controlling behaviour. Uh, which can go on for an extended period of time. Uh, the, the person may not have been subject to physical abuse, uh, but they have been subject to psychological abuse. And to be able to explain to women who come to them for advice and support that the, the, the type of psychological, the coercive and controlling behaviour they've experienced can now be uh, taken uh, before the courts and to explain to them how that the legislation works in, in doing that. So I think helping and supporting them as victims and also helping to advise them and to give them information about how the legislation works and in particular uh, to be able to inform them that the type of psychological abuse that they may, be, may have experienced uh, can now effectively be prosecuted. So they have an absolutely you know, key role in helping to support victims of domestic abuse um, before uh, and after, uh, once I've reported the matter to uh, the police and for the matter then to be taken forward by the Brocadier Fiscal. Yeah, and I, when I spoke to the manager of uh, Monklands Women Aid yesterday, she said uh, exactly that, that she's hoping that this legislation particularly will uh, allow more uh, women to come forward and, and actually there'll be more need uh, for, for their service. Do you think, uh, on, uh, and as a final question, I, I appreciate you, you, you might not be able to answer it, uh, Cabinet Secretary, but um, do you think that uh, local authorities will need to review the funding arrangements for such um, um, organisations like Women's Aid uh, locally, depending on how, uh, more, how, how much more uh, work they might be taking on as a result of the legislation? Well, we're down to individual local authorities to determine how they uh, wish to continue to fund Women's Aid um, uh, projects within their own uh, individual area. As a government, over the last couple of, uh, over a number of years now, we've put in record levels of funding into tackling gender-based violence, uh, whether it be through uh, the work that we do with the organisations such as Scottish Women's Aid or Rape Crisis uh, at Scotland. Uh, that's been a combination of funding which has come from uh, um, at the Equally Safe uh, uh, at work alongside the £20 million that we've been investing over the course of the last two and a half years through the justice uh, portfolio uh, in tackling gender-based uh, violence. So um, we all have a part to play, uh, and uh, I've got no doubt local authorities will want to look upon these matters sympathetically, given the importance of the role that women's aid projects play within their own individual uh, local area, and we'll continue to look to see what we can do to support the, the work they do at a national level as well. Yep. Uh, Rona, followed by Ben, Oliver, then John. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, we know that Scottish Women's Aid are, are very supportive of the bill, but they have argued uh, for the introduction of emergency barring orders, um, whereby it's the perpetrator of dom domestic abuse that leaves the family home and not the victim. Um, is this something you might consider? Well, just responding to the point that was raised earlier by your uh, colleague, that's an issue which we are engaging with Scottish Women's Aid on. Um, uh, and uh, we intend to write to Scottish Women's Aid just to um, uh, obtain more details about how they believe um, uh, emergency banning orders could be more effective than what we have at the present moment or where what we have at the present moment could be more effectively um, uh, uh, utilised. So that, that's an area which we are um, uh, open to discussions with Scottish Women's Aid on and we'll uh, be contacting them shortly in order to pursue that further. That's, that's fine, because I think it's generally perceived that it is 
generally uh, the women and children that would leave the family home and the, you know, the, the, the perpetrator would remain there. So that would be, be helpful if, if that was brought forward. Thank you. That's fine. Okay. Ben, followed by Oliver and John. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet morning. Secretary. I uh, <clears throat> wanted to refer back to Section 1 with, within the Bill around uh, the definition of, of this new offence. You touched on the, the concept of distress within your opening remarks, but I also wanted to pick up on the concept of recklessness and the inclusion within the Bill. In relation to recklessness, uh, Anne-Marie Hicks said in her evidence to the committee that it is important to note that it is not recklessness in a way that you or I might regard it in our ordinary lives as a kind of carelessness. It is a criminal recklessness. It is a criminal disregard in which the person disregards the possible consequences. The courts are used to applying those tests as our prosecutors. When we deal a lot with, uh, when we deal with a lot of different types of nuanced behaviour, as we will do under the bill, it will be useful to have the concept of recklessness. We do. Uh, we have seen that with uh, the stalking offence, which includes other types of behaviour that were perhaps not traditionally criminal, recklessness has been a very important concept in that. Um, However, we've also uh, received some evidence expressing concerns about the inclusion of recklessness within uh, section uh, 12B.2 and uh, as, uh, the inclusion of, uh, in, as, terms, as part of the, the mental element of the offence. What do you believe would be lost if the offence was one of intent only and, and didn't include recklessness? Well, I think on your first point uh, that you made, I think it's important to recognise is that uh, recklessness is distinct from carelessness uh, or uh, uh, negligence, and it is something which our courts are familiar with uh, in applying the law. So this is not um, unfamiliar territory to how our uh, courts should interpret these issues. And we do think that having uh, uh, regard to uh, uh, the reckless nature of uh, someone's actions is, is appropriate in this particular uh, offence. Uh, in domestic abuse, though, uh, when it comes to um, when it comes particularly to the, the psychological uh, and the coercive controlling behaviour, um, it, it could be uh, more difficult to uh, demonstrate intent in these matters. Uh, and that's why recklessness has been included uh, uh, within it. Uh, and it will, uh, uh, it will support the particular elements that we have around uh, uh, coercive and controlling behaviour and the psychological element of this offence uh, to be more effectively uh, prosecuted. So it is, uh, it, it, the reason it is included in there is um, not specifically, but it's with the, the with more of an intent to support us in tackling the psychological element of abuse, which can be more difficult uh, to demonstrate the intent of. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And, uh, as well, uh, and there was those who expressed concerns were um, concerned about a potential over-criminalisation and, and safeguards within that. Um, and Marie, Hick sorry, pardon me, and Marie Hicks. Uh, specified the, the different elements uh, that would en ensure that there, there wasn't an over-criminalisation or a miscarriage and justice around issues of the, the mens rea and also the uh, need for corroboration and just wanted to uh, absolutely clarify that you're satisfied that there's enough safeguards within the definition to, to make sure that uh, it is, is it as tight as it needs to be. Well, I believe they are in terms of the, uh, the threefold um, criteria that needs to be met before the offence can uh, be engaged, the uh, uh, nature of the um, way in which we've framed it as well. So I, I believe we have sought to try and achieve the balance. There is also the, um, uh, the statutory defence uh, within, uh, within the bill, which can be uh, uh, be utilised by, uh, by an accused as well. So I believe that the, the balance is right, um, including in relation to the mens rea um, within the uh, offence. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, there is, there is, it is, it is worth keeping in mind is that um, trying to, trying to, um, it is an offence where uh, it is that it's likely to have had an impact on an individual. So in considering issues, about it's likely to have an impact because particularly when it comes to psychological abuse, 
it could prove to be much more difficult to demonstrate beyond reasonable doubt that uh, that um, uh, psychological abuse um, has actually taken place. But we can see that a course of behaviour could, uh, is likely to, um, have resulted in psychological um, uh, uh, abuse of that person. And that's why we've framed the legislation in such a way as to, uh, as to give more of a focus on the effects that uh, the uh, abusive behaviour can actually have on the victim uh, in order to, to make sure that we can capture in particular that uh, the type of psychological abuse that we're intending to, uh, uh, intend to focus on uh, as part of the, the offence. Thank you for that clarity. Okay, Oliver, then John. Thank you, Convener. I wonder if I could ask the Cabinet Secretary whether he thinks it's right to talk about distinguishable occasions uh, within the context of this type of event, particularly given uh, what, what, what we know uh, about the nature of it. And just uh, for sort of uh, background information, why the Scottish Government decided to pursue that approach, talking about occasions in order to define the offence? Well, the, uh, the purpose behind it is to create the course of behaviour, so as to, um, uh, is to allow the courts to interpret. So, for example, um, it starts off with the um, uh, uh, abusive behaviour, having to uh, uh, demonstrate that abusive behaviour has taken place, and then the uh, uh, further criteria that comes from um, uh, 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 from uh, within the offence, but the uh, uh, course of conduct needs to be one which is considered to be a course of uh, conduct against something which is uh, which is not uh, uh, unfamiliar to our court. So, for example, it's used by it's used in a stalking offence um, uh, in considering the behaviour of an individual. So, something that may seem to be incidental in an isolated set of in an isolated occasion that uh, accumulatively over a period of time uh, uh, would, could be considered to be a course of conduct uh, that causes uh, concern for an individual. So, for example, in the stalking offence, it could be someone um, who they had concerns about uh, uh, seeing them in the shops on one occasion, and then uh, every other time they go to the shop, uh, they uh, find that that person is there again. Now, in an individual case, on one occasion, people may think, well, uh, uh, that's OK. Um, uh, but if it's happening on a, on a regular basis, that course of conduct, and that's why we've sought to bring it together as a, a course of conduct, um, which we know around psychological um, uh, abuse in particular, it tends to be the way that victims experience it. So why, why was the decision taken to attach a number to that, because what, what I'm imagining perhaps is maybe one sustained occasion that maybe isn't, you know, it maybe isn't possible to break it down into, you know, a number of different events. It could be one sustained sort of incident that continues over a long period of time. I just wonder whether by saying that there has to be two occasions, that type of thing wouldn't then be interpreted by the court as a pattern of behaviour. Well, if there was, if, if for example, if, if, if some, someone was subjected to um, uh, some form of um, uh, physical abuse on an occasion, then that could still be prosecuted uh, uh, as well. So that could still be uh, pursued. But the issue around the course of conduct that we've sought to achieve here is because we know that um, for many victims of uh, domestic abuse is that it can be a course of conduct that takes place over a period of time. Sometimes it can involve physical violence, but it can also involve psychological um, uh, 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 abuse. So, for example, it's, uh, you know, any uh, restricting the times when someone can leave. Um, uh, it, it could be, uh, uh, you know, uh, requiring them to bring back receipts uh, for everything that they purchase uh, when they're out, limiting the time uh, as to when they are around. Now, that may not all happen in the course of one occasion, but it could happen over the course of a period of time. Uh, in some cases, it, can be, it could be weeks, months, or it could be years. And it's for the courts to determine that course of uh, conduct in viewing that as, uh, as uh, a form of abuse. 
uh, and to then come to a determination on it. So it's about trying to pick up uh, individual instances on their own uh, that may uh, not be considered uh, to be abusive, but as a course of conduct alongside other factors, uh, then it would be considered to be a, a, a abusive uh, behaviour. And that's why we've sought to frame it in such a way as that there has to be in at least two occasions uh, so that that, uh, that single one-off occasion um, is not captured and then it would be viewed where it was unintentional or where there were uh, where it was a one-off occasion, it could still be prosecuted by other means, but for this offence, it has to be at least in at least two occasions uh, in order to establish that course of conduct. So if <clears throat> a partner was to deny uh, their partner of, say, access uh, to their bank account or to, to finance, and that started on one date and continued for you know, a year or a month, uh, or several weeks, that wouldn't be captured by this offence, or would you see that as as being multiple incidents? Well, that would be a, that would be over a number of occasions that was taking place. So it wouldn't be just in one occasion; it would be over the course of a period of time. So it would be a course of behaviour uh, that would be demonstrated. The other thing, as well, I think it's reasonable to say is that for many many victims of these types of crimes, is that uh, it very often is not one form yeah, no. um, of abuse that they experience um, if they're been denied access to their bank account, they're very often being denied access to a whole range of other matters and uh, being treated in, a, uh, in, a, uh, in an unacceptable way as well. So uh, that, would be, uh, that, would be one, uh, that would be one example of abusive behaviour, but it would be a course of behaviour that was actually played out over a number of occasions. Okay, no, that's, that's helpful. And I take your point regarding the multiple different uh, types of incidents that occur. Uh, you've talked at length about the three-stage test in establishing the offence, and you seem fairly satisfied uh, that that's sufficient. So I just wondered why uh, the statutory defence of reasonableness had been included. Well, the purpose behind that is to um, is that um, uh, there may be the rare occasions uh, where uh, the uh, reasonableness can explain uh, some of this behaviour and it's to make provision uh, that in those occasions that the statutory defence is available to them. It will be for the courts to then determine whether it actually um, it applies or not, uh, uh, but it's to provide that safeguard uh, that, uh, uh, that an accused can employ uh, the uh, statutory defence um, uh, if they believe that they can explain uh, that they acted in a a reasonable fashion uh, at that particular point. And you don't think that the uh, opportunity to do that would already exist in sort of taking evidence when the court's considering a course of behaviour? You think that it's needed uh, on top of it? Well, it would be... Uh, I'm very conscious that if we didn't have this provision within it, people would say is that there isn't a safeguard there for an accused to be able to actually say there was a reasonable reason uh, uh, as to uh, as to why we uh, uh, as to why I acted in such uh, in such a way, um, I, I'm confident with the with the the the, the with the uh, the way in which we've framed the actual offence, and also uh, the way in which we've created the uh, statutory defence that is available uh, to an accused that we get the balance right. Um, it will, of course, though, be ultimately down to the courts to determine that. Um, and when someone actually uses a statutory defence as to where they believe that it is um, it's appropriate and it's acceptable. And there's no concern from the Scottish Government uh, whatsoever that the defence might be exploited by uh, the accused in, in, in these type of cases, particularly you know, as another form of, of slowing things down or uh, trying to, to, to intimidate or, or undermine the victim? Um, uh, well, there's no evidence to suggest that's the case, and one of the provisions we've actually made within the legislation is to remove the ability of uh, an accused to be able to um, uh, uh, to uh, prognose a, 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 a victim of uh, an offence like this in order to provide greater safeguards for uh, victims. It's also fair to say that our courts, in terms of their performance in dealing with domestic abuse cases, uh, that they have, by and large, across the country, met the 10-week the target, which they were uh, set. So these cases are being dealt with uh, relatively quickly uh, through our court. But I'm, 
Uh, I'm not aware of any evidence that would suggest that by creating the statutory offence that we are going to um, that we are going to uh, slow down the process. Of course, you know, I would imagine any accused who's uh, in many cases accused will will, uh, will want to uh, put forward their own defence anyway, uh, whether it's using the statutory defence that's in this or not, um, uh, which will be considered by the courts and determined by the courts. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, John then, Mary. Yeah, thank you, convener. Um, it, this issue has been touched on, Cabinet Secretary, if I, if I might revisit it. Uh, and it's on the back of what are clearly raised expectations about what this can deliver. Now, I, I think this is going to be quite challenging for the courts to interpret. You talked about the, the training that would go into to, uh, the, this uh, legislation were it to pass. And we'll know that, obviously, the complainer will be informed by any information campaign, will have the support of... Uh, of some of the agencies, uh, Police Scotland are going to do training in, the, in any case of their specialist department, likewise Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service and their specialist unit there. Judicial training has always seemed to be a challenge. Um, can you guarantee that anyone deliberating on this will have specific training on these issues? Well, the part of the induction process for someone coming in uh, to, uh, to become a, a sentencer is that domestic abuse is part of the induction programme which they then go through. Uh, the rules around uh, the continued training of sentences is a matter that's overseen by the Lord President uh, through the, um, uh, the Judicial Institute, um, which is headed up by uh, uh, Alistair Duff. Uh, they make available ongoing training uh, for sentences, um, but it is down to individual sentences in determining uh, uh, what elements of training they want to pick up on. Now, it's worth saying is that not all of that training is face-to-face -face classroom type training. Uh, a lot of it can be provided online uh, and have a suite of um, online uh, uh, training uh, provisions within, the, uh, within their uh, uh, system. Uh, but the ongoing training of sentences um, is a matter for individual um, uh, uh, individuals themselves and is overseen by the Lord President. See, I take no reassurance from that whatsoever. When the limitation of childhood abuse, which we, we dealt with recently, we were aware of a provision where discretion could be exercised to waive the time limit, and it had only happened once in mm. 40 years. The, the, the judges are still seen as being very socially conservative. I think there needs to be some form of compulsion associated with this, or... And the, the next question I was going to come on to, a rollout of uh, domestic abuse courts, because it is about having all the issues come together, the criminal and the civil as well, and, uh, and have all the organisations come together. There are still some very intemperate comments coming out of judges, um, some wholly unacceptable last year, about domestic issues. Well... There's a couple of different issues in there. Uh, one is, um, uh, if if you make it if you make it compulsory training uh, on domestic abuse, there are no doubt there will be others who will say, but there should also be compulsory training on X, Y, and Z as well. So there is an element about, um, uh, uh, from my point of view, recognise independence of the judiciary uh, and the need to make sure that they have appropriate training available to them. The institute provides that uh, opportunity. Um, oversight is by the Lord President. Uh, but I'm, uh, you know, I'm conscious that if we get into making it a requirement to be trained in a particular type um, of uh, criminal offence, say, uh, in this particular offence, uh, there are others who would say, but they also need uh, other mandatory training on X, Y, or Z. Now, um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm open to uh, whether there are, whether there's a need for further mandatory training at various points in a sentencer's career to refresh their training. However, I'm, I'm cautious, I'm very conscious of the need to make sure that government isn't directing that. Uh, uh, but I uh, suspect that the member in the committee may wish to explore that with the Institute and also with the Lord President about where there should be a particular point when a, a refresh training has to take place for individual sentences. But I am conscious that if you, as I say, if you start to specifically say that you must do mandatory training on X, um, uh, then uh, there will be those who will say, well, but you've also got to provide mandatory training on uh, all of these other areas as uh, well. Can I turn to the issue, though, around you mentioned about domestic abuse courts? Now, we have domestic abuse courts in a number of 
eight areas. Uh, uh, for example, in the Highlands, the, the way in which the Sheriff Principal tries to operate the domestic uh, abuse court arrangements in Inverness is to try and cluster cases together, is that there are, at times, there are insufficient number of cases coming before the court to actually have a standalone domestic abuse court uh, on an ongoing basis. So, uh, when I was recently in, uh, in Inverness... Cabinet Secretary, if, if I can interrupt, though, but, but the clustering is a domestic abuse course, if you're doing it that well, way. Well, that's the point I'm coming I mean, to. It's not this perception people have it's a building. It is about the administrative arrangements so to support the, the, the process. You've, you've, you've jumped ahead to where I'm getting to. What they would say is that that is a domestic abuse court taking place. What they do is they cluster the cases together. What they don't have is enough cases to have a domestic abuse case court sitting on an ongoing basis. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what they try to do in some of the rural areas uh, to try and help to bring uh, these cases um, uh, together. And Sheriff Principals are very sensitive to trying to make sure that happens as and when uh, they can make those uh, arrangements. But I do think uh, you know that there is a there is, a, there is a line around government specifying the, the training for sentencers, and, uh, and that's not to say that I don't uh, recognise the point that you're making uh, about, about the value of having sentencers properly trained in considering issues around domestic abuse, uh, but I think the decisions on how that should be taken forward is a matter that should be looked at by the Institute and also by uh, the Lord President, who's got responsibility for oversight of training of our sentences. Okay, is, is there any uh, plans uh, in conjunction with this to roll out domestic abuse courts? Well, or, the, or the principle of clustering? Well, but sheriff principals are doing that just now um, uh, in different parts of the country. Is it where they don't have a sufficient number of cases that present on an ongoing basis is that they are seeking to cluster cases together so that they can have for a, a day or two day or three day period that they can have a range of domestic abuse cases that are going through at that particular point uh, in order to try and plan the services which are required around those particular cases. So, uh, so in that sense, there are more domestic abuse cases courts taking place. Uh, but not, in some areas, they are just not taking place on an ongoing basis because they don't have the volume of cases to justify sitting on an ongoing basis. And civil deliberations about these cases take, are part of the clustering, are they, or, or is that standalone? Um, I would have to check um, uh, the civil matters relating to it and how they, how they manage those issues. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Can I just ask you about um, contact, um, Cabinet Secretary, because we heard about two issues with um, contact while we were taking evidence and they're completely different. One is where a child is used by a parent who is the abuser to continue con co coercive or controlling behaviour. And the other is where a child is um, denied contact <coughs> with a parent who has been abused and is no longer resident in, in the home. And, and the the disruption to the contact is used to continue the abuse. Are you aware of these as issues and do you feel that this bill adequately tackles those two issues? Well, this bill is not intended to tackle these issues. I think that's the first thing uh, to recognise. Um, and the bill it was never intended to tackle these issues. Um, uh, I'm aware of the concerns that have been raised around um, uh, how the civil courts can process some of these mm -hmm issues around uh, uh, child contact, and that's why we've begun the process of reviewing uh, the uh, key area of legislation that deals with this, which is part one of the uh, Children in Scotland Act 1995. Um, I understand we've recently, officials have recently written to key stakeholders such as Women's Aid in order to obtain their views on this issue, uh, and we intend to have a public consultation on the review of uh, section part one of the uh, 1995 Act, uh, on the, uh, which relates to our family justice modernisation strategy, uh, which is due to start um, early next year. So it's an area we're aware of, but this bill is not intended to address those issues. Um, uh, but as part of the family modernisation strategy, uh, we intend to have a consultation on looking at how we can uh, address some of the issues of concern around this area. That's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, you've touched on training for sentencers, but some of the written submissions all also include some comments on early intervention and prevention of reoffending. If I could turn to the prevention, maybe first, um, the prof professionals at the NSPCC 
uh, expert forum were clear that the perpetrator programmes and services are often working with people long after the event, um, endeavouring to address uh, behaviours that become entrenched over many years. Uh, meanwhile, uh, during last week's meeting, the witnesses from SACRO indicated that the provision of rehabilitation programmes for per perpetrators of dom domestic abuse might be patchy. Are you satisfied there is across the country sufficient provision of rehabilitation programmes for people convicted of domestic abuse? Well, there's a, there's a range of programmes available, whether it be someone who um, uh, gets a community payback order on the programme that they can then be engaged in addressing their offending uh, behaviour. We also have the Caledonian programme, uh, which we operate in a number of areas. Um, I've provided some additional, we've provided some additional funding to the Caledonian programme to look at how we could potentially roll that out into other parts of the country and do that effectively. Uh, which works with uh, uh, perpetrators over an extended period of time, if I recall correctly, for about two years. Um, uh, so it's an extensive uh, research-based um, approach uh, to working with uh, uh, perpetrators of domestic abuse. Uh, we have that in a number of areas at the present moment, and we are looking to see whether that could be rolled out into other areas. And we've already commissioned work in order to look at how we could achieve that and how that would be taken forward. Um, uh, but there, is a, uh, there are other programmes which are available through those who, uh, if they receive a community payback order through criminal justice social work, to, uh, 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 to address their offending behaviour. So you're, you're confident these two um, things taken together should provide sufficient um, rehab programmes? <laughs> Uh, well, uh, would we want to do more? Of course, we would always want to do more. Uh, will people say we should do more? Of course, they will say we should do more. I'm, I'm confident we have a, a broad spread um, a, across the country. Um, uh, what we need to do is to make sure that the programmes which are being operated are effective and that they have a good evidence base in their effectiveness uh, to work with offenders in addressing their offending behaviour. Um, and uh, the Caledonian programme has got a strong evidence base, uh, which is built up over a number of years now, uh, and that's why we've commissioned this specific piece of work to look at how we could roll that out into other parts of the country. Um, and that piece of work, if I recall correctly, is due to report possibly later this year, um, uh, which will then inform how we could look at the look at it being arranged, uh, look at it being rolled out across other parts of the country. Okay, that's helpful. Um, turning to the early intervention, again, the NSPCC said that endeavouring to address behaviours that have become entrenched over many, many years is important. Early intervention to address coercive, controlling behaviour, gender-based violence with young uh, people is critical. And we would hugely welcome a commitment to funding appropriate prevention and early intervention programmes for young people with problematic um, behaviour in relation to gender-based violence. What, what is the Scottish Government doing to ensure that early intervention, including voluntary programmes, are available to help domestic abuse? Well, the first thing I should say is that this bill is not intended to actually deal with this particular issue um, as such. It's about creating a new offence. Um, the equally safe strategy is the strategy which the government has set out and how it will tackle gender-based violence. There's a whole course of work that's taken forward, but that's led on by my colleague Angela Constance uh, in setting out the types of programmes that are put in place to tackle gender-based violence. So it's about awareness programmes uh, in uh, tackling um, uh, in making sure people have respective um, uh, relationships. So, for example, from a justice-specific perspective, although it's not specific to uh, the equally safe strategy, the stuff we do around mentors and violence prevention, um, is about making sure that young people have got respectful relationships and that they are uh, addressing behaviour that's inappropriate uh, within their own school environment. We now have that across most of our local authority areas in Scotland where they have uh, sought to participate in the programme. But the, the strategy that tackles gender-based violence is the equally safe strategy that uh, sets out the range of work uh, that's taken forward by government. And uh, there is the, uh, there is the uh, implementation group that has a range of different stakeholders on it that are responsible for looking at the various strands of work that come from the strategy. I think really um, this has arisen to a large extent from the Scottish Police Federation's written response where they said just as a general 
observation, the fact that unlike other criminal, um, uh, other um, crime, the policy approach to domestic abuse is geared almost exclusively towards punishment, and they find that varies, variance with the diversionally and educational activities and with other crimes. So they were simply asking with a long-term strategy that seems to build on prosecutory activity is likely to bring about the attitude and changes necessary to eradicate domestic abuse. So I suppose they're looking just for some hint and connaissance within the bill that the two go hand in hand if this is to be effective um, <coughs> legislation in trying to eradicate this um, pretty vexing and horrific um, offence. I think we're confusing two different things here. Um, there's the issue around uh, 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 prevention programmes and tackling gender-based violence. That's what the Equally Safe Strategy is about. Uh, and it sets out a course of work that will be taken forward by government uh, working with other agencies to tackle gender-based violence. The other issue I think you're touching upon there is prosecution policy uh, and the policy uh, around prosecution of offences, mm -hmm. uh, which is a different matter. Um, and that's a matter for the Lord Advocate to determine how cases which relate to domestic violence are then dealt with by uh, prosecutors. Do they put it to the court or do they offer uh, an alternative, a diversion uh, from uh, prosecution? And I'm conscious that there are some who have said that they believe that there are cases that are presently going to the courts which they think should be dealt with by another means um, and domestic vi on domestic violence matters. And the, uh, 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 however, the decision around that policy area would be a matter for, uh, for the Lord Advocate to determine whether there was going to be any change in prosecution policy. So I think we're talking about two different issues here, um, although they are related in, uh, in some way. So, um, uh, so I'm clear, are you suggesting that there should be a change in prosecution policy and that there should be cases that are presently being referred to the courts that you don't believe should be getting referred to the courts? No, I'm just picking up on their comments that if this was too rigidly applied, almost like you know, uh, you weren't looking at any other um, option, which might have been a more effective in individual circumstances, because this is all about the individual circumstances. Well, that was quite clear from some of the evidence. Uh, I, and an in comment in one circumstance is exactly that, harmless. In another circumstance, it's really threatening and a, a classic example of coercive behaviour. So it's just, I suppose, helpful to tease out that um, this is very welcome legislation, but um, it should always be looked at within the context, is there a better way to deal with this? Have we got the circumstances that absolutely um, that absolutely tick the box for what uh, the kind of behaviour this this is supposed to address, and you've very rightly said it's it's a prosecutorial decision, and and for the judge at the end of the day to decide. Well, look, I, I'm I'm you know, there's absolutely no doubt that the way in which the police now deal with domestic abuse um, uh, over the course of the last 20 years has changed dramatically. Um, I, I can remember when I was in the Justice Committee in the. Uh, uh, in the first session of this parliament, uh, taking evidence from the police where they, and that's what, nearly 17, 18 years ago now, where the police at that stage actually still considered some aspects around domestic abuses to be private matters. Um, now, you'd never see that nowadays. There has also been an issue about how prosecutors have taken these cases before the courts and we know that our, prosecution, uh, our, our prosecutors are taking more of these cases to uh, the courts, largely because more are actually uh, being uh, uh, reported uh, to them. Uh, there is a suggestion that some people have is that they should have more flexibility in how they determine uh, which cases should go before the courts and which should actually have an alternative. If the committee are suggesting that if Parliament is to support this legislation, that, the, that our prosecutors should reflect on their existing prosecutional policy in these matters, that would be for a matter for the, the committee to, uh, to suggest but in determining where it should be happened, that would be a matter for the Lord Advocate and for the Lord Advocate to consider uh, once any new piece of legislation was in, uh, in place. Um, the bill doesn't deal with that, and I'm not aware of any plans uh, at the present moment uh, for prosecutors to change their policy around domestic abuse matters. Uh, but 
it would be for the committee to reflect the evidence that it's received and where they believe there is a need to uh, reconsider the present prosecutorial, prosecutorial, prosecutorial arrangements for dealing with these cases and where there needs to be a, a change in that. Um, but at this stage, I'm not aware of uh, any plans uh, for, the, for the Crown Office to do that. Right. I suppose in the Crown Procurator Fiscal Service, you'll know there were some concern around just how rigidly, or robust absolutely, but just how rigidly. So I think it was good to tease that out. Can I finally ask you that the Finance and Constitution Committee has provided us with a summary of the evidence submitted on the Bill's financial memorandum. It indicates that a number of submissions highlighted that it is a relatively high level of uncertainty in terms of providing the exact estimates of the cost of introducing the proposed offence. What reassurance, therefore, can the Cabinet Secretary provide that adequate resources will be made available to support the effective implementation of the Bill? Well, as is always the case with any new offence that's been introduced, it can be difficult to quantify the exact financial implications that it will actually have. So what we've tried to do is to uh, uh, look at what we consider to be is the most reasonable um, financial uh, 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 consequences which will come from the legislation. So, for example, we've used a central estimate of 6%, uh, which is based on uh, the impact uh, that uh, we know from, for example, in England and Wales around the, uh, around the impact that the legislation has had there, so that uh, the financial memorandum goes from uh, possibly 2% up to 10%, so we've sought that 6% to try and give us a, a broad figure that we believe will reflect uh, the overall financial implications relating to it. Um, but of course, uh, this is a piece of legislation which, if approved by Parliament, will be taken forward in stages. Our intention would be that uh, the first elements of it would be introduced in 2018-19, uh, and then the remaining elements of it would be introduced in the 2019-2020 uh, 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 time frame. And what we will do is we will look at refining that financial information uh, as we get closer to its implementation and to look at what financial support is necessary to make sure that the legislation has been effectively uh, uh, resourced and implemented. Uh, there are no other questions from members, so that concludes the oral evidence station on the bill. Um, the committee will consider the draft stage one report in September. So can I thank the Cabinet Secretary very much and his um, officials for attending. We now move into private session. Our next meeting will be Tuesday, 5th of September 2017.